Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on the 29th of June. I'm John Connolly, the Spectator's news editor and your host for this week. Coming up on the show. Putin faced one of the largest tests of his authority over the weekend as Wagner leader Yevgeny Prigozhin drove his troops towards Moscow. As the reckoning begins, how worried should we be and what could Russia look like after Putin? I'm joined by Owen Matthews and Dmitry Alparovich. What is the unspeakable truth about the housing crisis in Britain? Lionel Shriver writes for her column this week that it's legal migration. But is she right? Lionel makes her case on the show. Doping has been an age-old problem in the world of athletics, and several high-profile athletes have been exposed for taking performance-enhancing drugs. Could there be a world in which athletes compete in a space where doping is legal and encouraged? Aaron D'Souza and Damien Riley join me to discuss. And finally, you may have seen a sudden surge in people wearing blood glucose monitors. New studies suggest they can be a way to monitor health and lose weight. But Isabel Hardman thinks these fads could do more harm than good. She joins me on the show. Before we get going, thanks to our sponsors, Can Accord Genuity Wealth Management, for supporting the show. Can Accord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers, or for unwavering support in challenging times. Visit candywealth.com for more information. And if you enjoy Spectator TV, then do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. First up, can we begin to imagine a post-Putin world? In the magazine this week, we've taken a look at the fallout from Yevgeny Prigozhin storming on Moscow and the mafioso-style relationship between him and Putin. Joining me now is consultant and specialist Dmitry Alperovich and Spectator writer Owen Matthews. Owen and Dmitry, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, now, Dmitry, to start us off, it's, it's been a few days now since uh, Prigozhin called off his coup on his march on Moscow. He's since resurfaced in... Belarus. Um, what's the situation like in Russia at the moment? Has the, has the threat to Putin and Moscow in particular been, been completely neutralized? Well, the immediate threat has uh, abated. And uh, one of the things that Putin is now looks like to be considering, at least, is whether to execute a broader crackdown. Obviously, Prigozhin has now been exiled, at least for the moment, to Belarus. And by the way, Belarus is hardly in exile because Belarus has extradition treaties with Russia. Putin yesterday implied that maybe there might be some criminal charges uh, that would be pursued against Prigozhin for things unrelated to the mutiny, right? The amnesty was given for the mutiny itself, but he can certainly be prosecuted for corruption, misappropriation of state funds, tax evasion, uh, which, by the way, uh, doesn't even need to be made up because Prigozhin is very likely guilty of all of those things. So uh, as Henry Kissinger once said, it has the added benefit of being the truth. Uh, but uh, and Belarus can extradite him at any moment. So um, that that can be dealt with. But broader than that, certainly he has a problem in that the Russian military did not side with Prigozhin, but certainly stood aside and let him roll into Rostov, let him get to the almost the outskirts of Moscow without being stopped. And the people that either had prior knowledge of this uh, uh, mutiny or that let it happen uh, could be dealt with. And uh, Putin, there's no doubt, and Owen and I are, prob Owen and I are pro probably in agreement on this, there's no doubt that uh, Putin has been wounded by this, but I don't think he's been wounded mortally. And uh, if he executes a major crackdown a la Erdogan to go after any of uh, potential opponents or people that were not sufficiently loyal, he can reinforce his strongman image yet. And the Wagner troops themselves who kind of took over Rostov you know, we're marching further northward. What's happened to them now? Have they been absorbed into the Russian state or? Uh... Not yet. So there is this looming deadline of July 1st, um, uh, stemming from the order that Shoigu had given on June 10th, which really precipitated all of this, that said that all private military contractors, with Wagner being, of course, the most prominent, have to be dissolved and people either have to sign contracts with MOD or just go home, uh, but essentially cease to exist. Putin has reaffirmed that yesterday. Um, that this indeed should be the case, or they can go, I guess, the third option now is to Belarus. Uh, but right now they're uh, presumably in their uh, camps still in Luhansk and occupied Ukraine. Uh, they're still very well armed, so there's still a question of who is exactly going to disarm them. But uh, the Russian government does have one leverage, and Putin revealed this, of course, we, we already knew it, um, that all the money to pay for these people, to feed them, is coming from the Russian MOD. So if they stop paying them, um, and also at the same time present an option that if you can want to continue to be paid, here's a contract to sign with MOD, they're likely to get many of them 
uh, to sign on. And that's one way that they can disarm them and reabsorb them into the military. And I mean, this brings us nicely onto your piece in the magazine this week, which is sort of quite remarkable. It's about the fact that Wagner, whilst the most well-known, are not the only private army in Russia. Uh, I mean, can you tell us a bit about these groups and what kind of uh, what kind of danger they pose, uh, they pose to Putin, I guess? Well, it turns out that indeed uh, Wagner is the most prominent and most notorious, but uh, there are um, several different kinds of uh, private military groupings. Uh, one of them, which is sort of a um, separate story, is uh, Ramzan Kadyrov's um, uh, essentially Praetorian Guard, um, which is notionally part of the Russian National Guard, uh, but is paid for by the Kremlin, but un as basically under the personal command of Ramzan Kadyrov. And then there's a whole swathe of corporate armies uh, that have been put together by Gazprom. Some of them have been existed for several years, and they had their origins in private security companies that did secure that that that, that uh, protected oil installation installations, for instance, in Syria. Uh, but there's uh, I count at least a dozen sort of corporate affiliated. Uh, private military groups, uh, which reflect essentially the Russian government has been subcontracting military recruitment. Because uh, as we saw on September 21st last year, I was actually in Moscow at the time when it happened, uh, mobilization caused you know, panic. It caused a massive outflow of, uh, of, of uh, men of uh, military age, and it caused a rash of protests, including in Dagestan and so on. So clearly, uh, the Kremlin has been desperate for men right from the beginning of this, uh, or you know, from when the military campaign started going wrong. And uh, so desperate are they that they're just willing to uh, pay private companies to assemble these private armies, um, private military companies. Notionally, they are they're not literally the private army of the board of Gazprom. Uh, let's be clear. They do actually have some kind of subordination within the structure of the Russian military, and they're paid for by the Russian military. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, that's a, you know, clearly a potentially extremely dangerous situation, as um, as the Wagner mutiny showed. And there's a third type of, um, uh, sort of private military formation, and that uh, those are essentially sort of uh, bodies of volunteers, of military age that have been put together by uh, the Sergei Aksyonov, the, 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 the head of, uh, of uh, Crimea, and another, some others associated with uh, various Cossack bodies with uh, in South Russia, with Konstantin Malafiev, who is a Orthodox uh, nationalist um, TV mogul and billionaire. So you have a lot of military formations beyond Wagner, whose loyalties are, you know, notionally, they've signed up, all of them, for contracts with the Russian army, as Dmitry just uh, mentioned. But that doesn't necessarily mean that their primary loyalty, in the case of the set that the center does not hold, uh, their loyalties may well be divided. And do you think that attempt by Putin to rein them in is, is going to be successful? Well, there's only one that needs reining in, um, and it was precisely Putin's attempt to rein in Wagner, essentially to shut it down, that was the proximate uh, cause of this uh, of this rebellion, uh, as as Dmitry said. I mean, they, they had to re essentially rebel or die. Uh, Putin ordered the disbanding, essentially, of Wagner. And then, at least by Prigozhin's own account, they then came under shell fire, rocket fire, uh, from their own side because uh, the Russian defense ministry wanted them dead. So that was really the reason for this mutiny. They did not have a political agenda. Prigozhin was actually quite careful not to criticize Putin personally, although he viciously criticized Sergei Shoigu, the Minister of Defense, and he viciously criticized the way the Kremlin has um, has fought the war. So it was definitely more of a mutiny than a coup. Uh, so in that sense, it's different from 1917, when Lev Karnilov, who was a very popular general, marched on uh, on Petrograd and basically destroyed the, the credibility of the provisional government. Uh, Prigozhin and Wagner is not that. But clearly, um, the spell has been broken um, that uh, Putin is the guarantor of Russian safety and security. I mean, he clearly is not. And furthermore, I mean, the reaction of the people of Rostov-on-Don, 
uh, they treated the Wagner like heroes. They came out on the streets and, and there are hundreds shouting Wagner, Wagner. And when the police uh, showed up to supervise Wagner's withdrawal, uh, they shouted shame, shame. So it, th those scenes are definitely echoing, I think, in Putin's head, assuming, of course, that he's seen them. We don't know what he sees. He doesn't use the internet. He thinks it's a CIA plot. But, um, you know, clearly this is a very profound blow to his authority. And thirdly and finally, you know, we, the Wagner takeover of uh, Rostov on Don, this, the headquarters of the Southern Military Command, which is the nerve center of the Ukrainian war, was unopposed. And despite the fact that Putin spent the day handing out medals to the people who supposedly saved Russia from civil war, uh, that doesn't really make it true. No one saved Russia from civil war except maybe Alexander Lukashenko, who finally, who essentially communicated Putin's complete capitulation to the rebels. And Dmitry, so say if you are Putin holed up in the Kremlin at the moment, obviously this has been a massive blow to your authority, as you're both saying. Where does he see the next threat to be? Because, you know, he must be incredibly paranoid at this point. He probably is paranoid, but honestly, I don't think that there is uh, any eminent coup. And, and it is worth repeating what Owen just said, that Prigozhin did not want to replace Putin. And no, nor did I think he could have replaced Putin. I mean, imagine the scenario where he's wildly successful. He rolls into Moscow. He takes the Kremlin. He you know, arrests or shoots Putin. And then what? You know, you can't run the country with your 25,000 people mercenary group when you have no political base, when no one uh, in the country is particularly loyal to you uh, across the elites, across the various governors and security for forces and so forth. So congratulations, you may have just started civil war or disbandment of the country where everyone's going to pursue their own interests, but you're not really running it just because you've taken one building, right, in Moscow. So that is a problem that anyone would face that would try to challenge or replace Putin, you know, a certain general perhaps could do what Prigozhin has done, but they don't have the political power, they don't have the national recognition, they don't have the elite support to be the chosen candidate, if you will. And that's uh, the one saving grace for Putin is that he has eliminated, you know, effectively all opposition over the last 20 years to his rule and, and made himself um, sort of Tina, as the stock market has been saying for three years on, on other things, there is no alternative, right? Um, but the danger to him is not necessarily that I think he's going to get a bullet in the head from someone surrounding him, but that increasingly the elites will decide that if Prigozhin can get away with this, um, what can I get away with? Can I start doing things in my own little region if I'm a governor of a you know, distant region in Russia where I'm not going to ask Kremlin for permission to perhaps steal more, to aggregate more power. Uh, I'm not going to go, mother may I, I'm just going to go do it and ignore what the Kremlin is doing. And in some ways, if Putin continues to allow this to happen, he may turn into his own worst nightmare, which is his predecessor, um, Yeltsin, who towards the end of his reign had become a joke and, and was mostly ignored by everyone. He was still president and could still issue orders, but everyone was joking around him uh, with um, uh, for power and building their own clans and, and trying to dismantle pieces of Russia for their own benefit. And that's what this can get into if Putin does not put a stop to this. And I want to emphasize that he still has an opportunity to consolidate power after this major blow. Uh, he can do a crackdown, Erdogan style, reinforce that he's still the strong man. If you do this to me, I'm going to make you pay and, and convince everyone that maybe it's not worthwhile to continue to ignore him. Mm. And I mean, that's, that's been Putin's point, hasn't he, in his speeches since the, since the uprising, that he is the sort of the only thing standing between you know, Russia and chaos, um, as it was at the end of the communist era. I mean, do you, do you, do you think as well that that's, that's where we're heading, though, sort of a fraying at the edges of the Russian state and a weakness of his authority there? Yeah, well, stability has always been Putin's unique selling point right from the beginning. Um, the, you know, right from 1999, he came to power as a sort of macho uh, prime minister, a former head of the FSB. And there was a series of as yet unexplained, highly suspicious apartment bombings. And he, uh, Putin was this sort of tough guy who was able to promise to, um, you know, um, rub them out in the, in the outhouse and so on. Um, uh, the, the 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 main threat i think to putin or the main end game for putin is that the elite uh the russian elites decide that he can no longer guarantee their privileges and can no longer actually be a credible uh, sort of guarantor of not just 
we're not talking about democratic politics. We're talking about the con- the contract essentially between the, tre- the Kremlin and the business elite and the bureaucratic elite. It's already been put under enormous strain, by the way, by the war, which has been undoubtedly unbelievably bad for business. You know, huge swathes of the Russian elite have had major uh, damage to their assets, to their um, uh, to their freedom of movement, you know, their, their 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 businesses. They have you know, the, the war has hurt them in the wallet. But you know, as we uh, as we can observe, there's been actually very little public criticism from within the Russian elite. Uh, they just prefer to stick with Putin as they have done for twenty years and remain silent. But we keep we you know people don't discuss enough the fact that Putin is up for re-election in eight and a half months' time. March 17th, 2024, is the next presidential election. Everyone kind of assumed that the, 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 the he would just uh, uh, you know, stand again and that would be rubber stamped through. But I think there's actually a lot of uh, uh, um, you know, quite strong feeling within the elite um, that you know, maybe he's not the right guy. But there's a flip side to that. Uh, and that is that perhaps an unintended effect everyone has been predicting, everyone is saying, and it's and it's true, and Dimitri and I agree, we rarely agree, but on this one we do, we do strongly agree that he's been weakened, that he's been weakened by this. That's undoubtedly true. But there is a sense in which uh, I think the Prigozhin revolt has shown that there are forces beyond the Kremlin's control, they're ultranationalist, they're very pro-war, this was not an anti-war revolt. The people that came out on the streets of Rostov were not anti-war. They thought Wagner were heroes because they were the guys that had been giving the Ukrainians the best kicking. You know, these, this is not like a sort of revolt of pacifists at all. And the fact that uh, the security and stability uh, of the Putin security state has proved to be so brittle, so fragile, actually uh, makes it rather daunting and frightening to mount a challenge to Putin. So in that sense, actually, I think for people within the Russian elite who might have been thinking of, uh, you know, shuffling off Putin, I think this whole Prigozhin episode may give those people considerable pause uh, because I think they realize very clearly and it's been demonstrated over the weekend that actually a sort of catastrophic loss of authority by the, the Kremlin can very quickly descend. And that's kind of the point about my, uh, my, my piece about these private arms. Armies. You know, the conditions are there, uh, potentially, uh, they're not there now, uh, but the conditions are potentially there for something really catastrophic to go wrong and for the, the Putin succession to c- go out of the hands of the elite who would manage it into something unpredictable and, 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 and catastrophic, which would be and chaotic, which would be terribly dangerous, not just for Russia and the world, but also for Ukraine, by the way. Mm. And Dimitri, just to finish off, we probably should turn to Ukraine. I mean, from their perspective, you can imagine it's only good news that Russia is in a bit more chaos than it than it was before. But do you think this is going to this uprising is going to make a serious difference to the war effort, or do you think Russia have managed to get a handle on things now? No, and as we saw, even in the midst of the chaos over the weekend, uh, guess what? The strikes on Ukraine continued. They launched uh, a huge barrage of missiles, literally as this um, mutiny was taking place. Uh, one of the first things that Prigozhin did when he took over the Southern Military District Headquarters, which is the nerve center for running the war in Ukraine, uh, is he said that everyone's continuing their jobs. I'm making sure that the war is prosecuted, the supplies are flowing, the missions are being conducted. He did not put a stop to any of that. And of course, the line still held, you know, as the Ukrainians keep probing it in Zaporizhia and elsewhere, um, the Russians were not, you know, surrendering or fleeing. Uh, they were holding strong and, and, and fighting. And, and by the way, history also um, uh, is a useful lesson here. Uh, Owen mentioned 1917. 1917 was the year of two revolutions, right? The uh, revolution against the Tsar that brought in the provisional government and then the Bolshevik revolution that um, overthrew the provisional government. In the midst of all of that, you know, massive civil unrest in the country, the war uh, and Russian participation in World War I continued. Um, up until the Bolsheviks ultimately uh, made peace with the Germans. So um, the idea that wars just end because there's unrest in the country um, is not supported by historical evidence. And, and as Owen mentioned, the people that were revolting here, the, the Wagner mercenaries and Prigozhin, were not anti-war at all. Um, they think it should be prosecuted with even um, uh, more aggressiveness and uh, with total mobilization of society and the like. 
So I don't think that it has an immediate impact on the war, but, but here's where the war plays a role for Putin. If he suffers another major defeat in this war, let's say that uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive succeeds, they're able to liberate much of the South, threaten Crimea, that's another blow to the regime, right? He's already demonstrated weakness. This is now going to have an additive effect. And that can really, I think, uh, uh, be very dangerous for him. And as Owen said, like the elites can decide that maybe it's time for him to set a, a step aside, not necessarily in a coup, but, you know, Owen correctly mentioned that next year the presidential election can be pivotal. So you could see uh, people, including friends of Putin, coming to him and saying, look, old man, you clearly don't want this job anymore. It took you 13 hours to respond to this mutiny once it got started. Why don't you step aside? It could be someone like Nikolai Patrushev, for example, an old buddy of his from the KGB days, who is the uh, head of the National Security Council, actually older than Putin. But he may say, my son, who you've helped promote, now an agriculture minister, the next generation, let's pick him as the next candidate. You stand down from the elections. He, he runs and wins, and we'll make sure that you're protected. You keep your ill-gotten gains. Uh, no one is going to send you to The Hague. Um, and uh, we're going to move on to, to, to new blood. Um, you could see that scenario playing out, you know, impossible to say how likely, but that's one way in which power can transition away from Putin without there necessarily being a coup. An interesting twist on the men in grey suits there. Um, thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Owen. That was fascinating. What are the causes of the housing crisis? And is there one cause that people don't want to talk about? Author and Spectator columnist Lionel Shriver joins me now. Lionel, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, you start your column this week by talking about the housing crisis, and in particular when you appeared on Any Questions last year, and you said something quite shocking to the audience um, that, that caused a bit of a stir. Can you, can you tell us what that is? Well, uh, someone in the audience asked uh, how, how I suggested that uh, we improve the chances of young people being able to get on the housing ladder. And I said, uh, limit immigration. <laughs> you can feel the entire audience just go, what did she say? <laughs> um, but the truth is that uh, for 50 years, uh, Britons have had a below replacement rate fertility. And um, I was astonished to find that figure. Uh, which means that the only source of um, of the growth of the population is basically newcomers, um, and and I, I one of the one of the problems that the UK has is that it's never um, grappled with what's the what's the long term game plan on population. You know, how many people do you want to live on th that island? And um, and it's 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 a it's it's primitive. It's a, it's along with, you know, where is your water coming from or your what is your long term energy plan? What is the long term demographic plan? Because uh, no population can infinitely grow. And that's just. That's just a physical fact. So how many people does Britain want to have? And all, all we've got is short-termism. So, and if you're constantly um, trying to solve the, uh, the problem of age structure by bringing in more people, the logic of that is an infinite growth in population. And the column this week is, mostly looking at the issue of housing. And that's one of the real limits on the number of people that you can bring in. Um, ever since I've lived in Britain, governments have talked about increasing house building. They never meet the targets. And that's re it's this pressure on population that is driving the uh, unaffordability of British housing. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's a, a simple uh, economic rule of supply and de demand. And when you can't meet supply, then the the price goes up always. And um, 
so you've got this situation where, especially in London, some sad little hovel is a million pounds, right? Um, and the same problem uh, pertains to rent because we, uh, when housing is restricted, then the rent goes up. Um, and then the government makes it worse with all kinds of policies. I could do another column on the rental situation. Um, Lionel, just keeping to supply at the moment, I mean, you've got some quite remarkable statistics in your piece. Can you just give any viewers sort of a, a bit of context about how much the population of the UK has gone up uh, because of immigration compared to sort of previous years? Well, if you look at, um, if you look at the British population from 1973 for the next 25 years, you know, before Tony Blair, the, it was very close to steady state. I mean, it, it, it increased by about two and a half million people. Um, and with you, you still got the baby boom people having children. That makes sense that there would be a small increase. Uh, immigration was almost negligible. Um, but then in the next 25 years, uh, Britain increased nine and a half million. And it, it, it's, the difference is huge. And it's clearly coming from immigration. And this is also, uh, the, the increase is accelerated by the fact that immigrants, especially non-EU immigrants, tend to have larger families. Um, and uh, Migration Watch has done a, a meticulous study on the implications of this rate of immigration and, you know, on, on the housing market. And last year, according to the government's own figures, uh, we had a net gain in immigration of 606,000 people. And so Migration Watch was looking at, okay, if we just stay at that rate, not increase, which is what we've been doing every year, more people come in. Um, if we just stay at that 606,000 per year, how many houses do we have to build? And there is a range depending on certain assumptions, especially depending on the fertility rate, but uh, it's consistently many more houses. Uh, than are currently being built and have any chance of being built. And then you've got the, 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 the other problem, which I mentioned, is that not only do we have planning permission roadblocks, but the money's in luxury housing. That's, that's what the developers want to build. I mean, if you look around London, I mean, even in my kind of crap neighborhood, um, <laughs> Luxury housing is going up everywhere, and it happens to be hideous. <laughs> uh, they're, they're all using the same architect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Untalented, I have to add. I can picture them all now, now you're saying that. <laughs> but, you know, this does not help the majority of people who, who need to get on, on the housing ladder or who need a place to rent. Um, it's, it's playing to the, the top of the market. And and it's and that's not where the need is. I'm right in saying you don't think we're building enough now wholesale. I think the government have said they've got a target of 300,000 homes a year. Do, do you think that would be enough or do you think that's kind of drop in the ocean kind of thing? Even 300,000 a year at current levels of immigration is insufficient. Um, you have to build over 300,000 a year. And by the way, you have to add on uh, some housing that has to be built just to stay where you are. Uh, as a homeowner, I will testify that buildings fall apart <laughs> every day. <laughs> so, um, so while Migration Watch didn't specify what that level is, I don't know, but it's, it's not zero. So, um, what I'm suggesting is that, you know, building, building housing is, is hard. It's cumbersome. It takes up space. There are many, many issues uh, to consider with the, you know, the roads and the energy and, and, and the water, et cetera. 
uh, it is easier for us to control the demand than the supply. Mm. I was going to say, because there are some people who make the argument that, you know, immigration is quite important to the UK economy and that we should just kind of build, build, build to kind of meet that demand rather than focus on reducing, um, you know, the supply of immigrants. I mean, what do you make of that argument? Well, I think any demographer would tell you that if you are ever going to have a steady state population, um, you have to go through a period of economic pain, which means that you you have too few young people supporting too many old people. And then eventually that evens out. You, you know, you're going to have a bulge in the population. Otherwise, you just keep bringing in more people. Um, Migration Watch did another study, which I touched on in another column, um, which w- looked at, uh, this one was back in um, 2010. And so they were how many people you would need to bring in to maintain the same support ratio as there was in um, 2008. And uh, it had something like three, they calculated something like 300 million people, which is, you know, close to the population of the United States um, by, you know, I don't want to misquote them, something like mid-century or the end, it doesn't even matter or the end of this century, uh, because Britain would never be able to fit 300 million people onto the island. And that's just by way of an illustration that you cannot keep solving the labor shortage or the the, the, the need for um, more young people to support the old people you can't keep solving that by bringing in new people. And because because the new people get old like everyone else, and then they become the old people that you need to bring in more young people to support. And, uh, you know, ideally, uh, the, the, the fertility, fertility rate goes up a little bit, and that would be the, the optimal way to even out the support ratio. But that's not something that is easily legislated. So maybe we shouldn't hold our breaths. Yes. Um, I should say as well, you make this clear in your piece, but for anyone watching, um, you make a quite clear distinction between illegal, um, illegal migration on boats and what you're talking about here, which is more legal migration. Do you think the UK debate probably focuses too much on the boats? And that kind of leads us to odd, odd policy decisions. Oh, yes. I mean, I can understand why uh, the small boat situation gets so much attention. It's um, it's very dramatic. You know, it, it, it makes good TV. All these people getting off the dinghies and bunged onto these tiny boats. It's filmic. But um, that's not where the numbers are. Uh, the, the, the problem is legal immigration. Uh, the Home Office is letting in huge numbers of people. And, um, and the figures, you know, the figures also don't include uh, things like visa overstayers. The people who come through the airport and, and say they're here on tourist visas and then just disappear. We have no idea how many of those people are. And that's so much easier than getting into a dinghy. I bet there, there are far more visa overstayers than there are, um, uh, migrants in small boats. That's not to say we shouldn't solve the small boats problem, um, which is getting worse and is starting to be statistically significant. Um, but it is something of a distraction if we're interested in keeping the numbers under control and and therefore getting on top of things like the housing shortage uh we should look to legal immigration primarily. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lionel. My pleasure. Next, should athletes ever be allowed to dope in athletics? Do some of the most notorious sportsmen of our time have come under fire for doping? Some think it is time to open the floodgates. Aaron D'Souza, founder of the Enhanced Games, has done just that. Damien Riley thinks this could be the end of sports as we know it. They both join me now. Okay, Aaron and Damien, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Now, before we start, um, we're going to watch a little bit of trailer about the Enhanced Games, which you've launched this week, Aaron. 
I am the fastest man in the world. But you've never heard of me. I have broken Usain Bolt's 100 meter record, but I can't show you my face. I am a proud, enhanced athlete. The Olympics hate me. I need your help to come out. I need your help to stop hate. I need your help for the world to embrace science. Brilliant. Um, it's quite an intriguing trailer there. Can you tell us a bit about the Enhanced Games, what it is and why, why you think this is needed? The Enhanced Games is an alternative to the corrupt and dysfunctional Olympic Games, and it's the first international sports event without drug testing. We're openly embracing scientific innovation in this era of rapidly changing social norms. So when is this going ahead? Next year, is that right? Plan is to run the first event in December of 2024. And sorry, the athlete in that trailer there says he can run faster the 100 meters than Usain Bolt at his, at his world record. Is that real? Is Absolutely, that, yes. And, and who is this person? Are they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I say is that um, being enhanced is a journey. Uh, and it's a journey of coming out. It's a t it's a quite a tough one for athletes to even discuss this. Uh, and I admire all the athletes who have been involved in this project, particularly those who have agreed to publicly be attached to the project. Um, people like Olympians like Brett Brett Fraser, Christine Smith, Roland Schumann, um, and they're the ones who are the most courageous. Mm. And so, Damien, you write about the enhanced games uh, perspective of life this week. Yeah. Ryan is saying you don't agree with it, but you also think that doping is a massive problem in sport at the moment. So can you explain a bit what, what you are Yeah, so I suppose I'm cynical about the status quo. I think this is filling a natural <laughs> vacuum. I think that uh, I think a lot of people believe that athletes in general are doped to the gills mm -hmm. uh, and are competing and the tests don't work and they're not being caught. And so they have no choice but to cheat. Uh, and I think this is probably filling a vacuum and saying, well, if cheating is happening on an industrial scale anyway, why not make it legal? Um, so I think that's what you're doing. That's absolutely right. And I'm not saying eliminate the Olympics. Uh, au contraire, you know, we hope that there is a natural world of the Olympics, the old slow Olympics. And on the other side, a science enhanced world of the fast, exciting enhanced games. I mean, do you worry, Aaron, that, you know, a lot of these athletes, if they take lots of performance enhancing drugs, a lot of these drugs have pretty nasty side effects. I mean, do you worry that you're creating sort of a dangerous situation for the people taking part? Ultimately, adults with free and informed consent um, must be, absolutely must be, entitled to make decisions about their own body. My body, my choice, your body, your choice. And I don't think any government or paternalistic sports organization should be telling adults what they can and cannot do with their own bodies. Mm -hmm. The risk that one wishes to take is ultimately an individual choice. Should we have told the Apollo astronauts they couldn't have gone to the moon because it was dangerous? Maybe those people who went in the submarine down to the Titanic, was that too dangerous? Mm. Maybe having 10 cups of coffee or maybe even eating sugar, right? Where do we draw the line? And I do not trust the government or its uh, entities in, in the sports world to make that judgment for individuals. Mm. And David, you make a kind of different point, which is that the value of these games is kind of less because we're not sort of seeing the limits of the human body. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, I agree. I don't disagree with anything you've just said. I think that uh, if people want to ingest these substances, I mean, I'm guessing the people that went down the submarine, maybe they could have been warned not to do that. It was quite dangerous. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I don't think I disagree with that in principle. What I'm saying is that uh, I think a doped games, which is what this is, you call it the enhanced games, but it's a doped games, mm. um, essentially is quite dull. It becomes a bit like bodybuilding, where you know that everyone's on steroids and you can see what they're doing. And it's kind of an interesting spectacle for a little bit, but I don't think it will have the relatability of, say, the Olympics, where um, there's a universality to it, which is that everyone can run and jump um, without taking, you know, unnormally. Do you and think that Hollywood is unrelatable? Unrelat because most uh, Hollywood uh, celebrities use plastic surgery to enhance themselves. Most male movie stars are probably on steroids. You know, I'm not going to make any accusations, but you only need to look at uh, all the superhero uh, physiques and they're largely unattainable by mere mortals. And so does that make Hollywood unrelatable or does that make something uh, that we aspire to? I think that's an interesting question. I think Hollywood has become increasingly unrelatable in recent decades. I think maybe before uh, 
the, all the film stars were enhanced through plastic surgery and the storylines were ludicrous, <laughs> I think it was more relatable. Um, so yeah, but I get your point. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing in principle with it, I just don't think it's particularly interesting. Or, because it doesn't tell us ultimately much about ourselves. It doesn't tell us... Uh, I believe that the purpose of sport is to tell us of what we're capable as a species, mm. um, what the human body is capable of. Um, but if you know that people are enhanced, by definition, uh, they're not like us. Well, I think you actually have to d distinguish what you've said there. You said um, the purpose of sport is to show us what we're capable of as a species. Mm -hmm. And then you said purpose of sport is to show us what we're capable of as individual humans. Both. Both, right? And as a species, uh, scientific progress is probably our greatest asset. And so we are at the enhanced games. So visibly illustrating the capabilities of athletic excellence, individual athletic excellence, plus collective scientific progress. But doesn't the word enhanced in the title imply unhuman, inhuman, better than human? Absolutely. And shouldn't we aspire to be better than what we are today? Something greater? Um, you know, the use of enhancements is commonplace in many industries. I gave the example of Hollywood. Another example might be the city of London, the Wall Street, the financial sector, the use of neural enhancements such as Adderall are so commonplace that when there was a shortage uh, a few months ago, it caused a drop in overall productivity uh, in the United States by 3%. And the use of beta blockers, <laughs> the use of beta blockers by classical musicians, orchestral musicians, might be up to 75%, helps them focus, right? And so, I think uh, as a society, we should celebrate the use of technology to make us better. Does something like um, a writer who uses chat GPT... Never. never. <laughs> <laughs> of course you'd say that here at the Spectator. <laughs> Is there anywhere you'd draw the line, Aaron? I mean, you know, people putting biological implants in, do you mm. think... Are there any drugs that you'd think, no, this is too far? Um, you know, we have such an opportunity with all the scientific and technological change that is happening. And so the existing sports federations are stuck in the past. <clears throat> the Olympics are focused on this ideal of Greek gods and ancient history, and we're focused on the future. And the ethical complications that will come with social and technological change are gigantic. So think about um, CRISPR babies, Gattaca babies. There are children being born today who, whose parents have had them genetically edited so that they are enhanced babies. And in 10 or 15 years' time, they will want to compete at the Olympic Games. This is eugenics you're getting into. Well, no, I'm, we're not getting into this at all. It's, it's parents who are making this decision for children yeah. today with CRISPR babies. Should they be banned from sporting competition? No, I think more interesting question is, what about, um, say, Oscar Pistorius with the blades yeah. on his feet, and he could run faster than human beings? Yeah. Would you welcome that? Would you say that, that a, a man with springs on his feet can compete in the 100 meters or 200 meters or the high jump? Uh, Where do you draw the line? Is it just drugs or is it enhancement in other ways? So in terms of physical, like cybernetic enhancements, maybe not at the 2024 enhanced games. We'll have right. to design a rule set so that can be a fair and level competition, but absolutely. And I would love to see an athlete, uh, a Paralympian, compete side by side and be fully abled athletes. Wouldn't that say something extraordinary about the capability of people with a physical disability to rise up and to um, you know, compete on the same level? My point is that it wouldn't. I think it would be ultimately dull to see that. I think it is, I get it, I get it and I can see it's a sort of dystopian vision of the future. <laughs> and maybe not dystopian, maybe this, this clip will be used in years to come of some idiot saying it was going to be boring when it's the most watched thing ever. Um, but I think ultimately... 3.1 million views on Twitter uh, in one week alone. It's an interesting idea and it's a sort of pub conversation people have had, why don't you just legalise the drugs? Mm -hmm. yeah. But it takes, it separates sport from, from us because we aren't enhanced. Kids running in parks aren't enhanced. When I go for a jog, I'm not enhanced. Uh, well, it and depends so it what makes you these people are no longer relatable. So drink, if, I, if, I, if I run in a park, if I run my terribly slow 10K, and I can look and see who the fastest humans ever to run 10K are, and that's interesting to me because mm. I'm a human, they're a human, none of us are enhanced. But if there's a bunch of people, as I say in the article, they may as well be on wheels for all I care. It is totally, they are using anabolic steroids and I'm not. Therefore, 
big wow. I mean, Aaron, are you tempted to sort of just cut out the humans entirely and just have machines race up and down on the track? Well, F1 is a wildly popular sport. <laughs> F1's a very good example. Yeah. So F1, as I say in the article, yeah. the engineers are of far more importance than the drivers. Mm. And so your games, I think, the scientists would be far more important than the athletes. So the story would be about what the scientists well, did. I'd, I'd actually disagree with that because the highest paid people in Formula One are the drivers, right? The drivers earn more money. But if you're a driver in a terrible car, it doesn't matter. But if, if you're a terrible driver you are, in a great car, have you ever tried to drive an, a, a Formula One car? It's extremely it, difficult. No, I haven't. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you put Lewis Hamilton in a car towards the back of the grid, he's not winning F1 races. Sure. And they're all, it's, a good, it's kind of a good analogy because the drivers are all to, you know, elite drivers. There isn't that much to separate them, but the performance of the car does separate them. Um, and therefore, it's about the engineers. The drivers may I mean, get the more, more money. But. That's, that's a really interesting point. I mean, what do you think will separate number one and number two in your enhanced games race? Will it be the skill of the athlete or the skill of the program they're on in terms of drugs? It will be a combination of both, right? And that's uh, exactly like the case in Formula One. There's skill and tactics of the athlete. Uh, plus the engineering capabilities of a whole team. And what is beautiful about Formula One is that you can so obviously see what the team is, right? You know, it's the engineers, it's the mechanics coming in for a pit stop. It, it makes for exciting television. And Formula One is having an absolute renaissance. Uh, its television numbers are skyrocketing and its engagement in the United States is off the charts. And um, I think this is where the future is going because it, it shows us the potentiality of us as an entire species. And there's always this kind of tacit lie among uh, at the Olympic Games about individual excellence. You don't see the coaches, the trainers, the physiotherapists, the doctors behind those athletes. And let's be open and honest, it, it takes a village. So you'd have the scientist and the athlete on the podium together holding the syringe. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, so I think I, I totally understand what you're doing and I think it's great and I think there's a natural vacuum. Mm. I interviewed uh, the chemist, Memo Hernandez, who doped, he was the doping chemist and he doped all the uh, Marion Jones and all, he says all the finalists at the, the Beijing 100 meters mm. Olympics. Yes. And he was very straight. He said, if, you, if you're a low level athlete you, and you give me 10,000 quid, I will make you a potion that probably will show up on, on tests. So you take your chances, it might not show up on others. If you give me a hundred thousand pounds, I'll make you something so good, no test in the world can detect it. Mm. And this goes on and it's been going on for ages. We see athletes smashing times that were set by dopers um, across a range of disciplines. So the reason that people are watching less and less athletics and others, well, not main athletics, is because we don't believe what we're seeing anymore. Mm. Yeah. And so what you're doing, is, I, I completely get, but I think a much more interesting thing to do would be to take the money that will presumably go into this and create unbelievably exquisite tests for, for doping in athletes. So there is then a level playing field for everybody, and then we go back to basics and it becomes much more interesting. Well, the World Anti-Doping Authority has effectively an unlimited budget, courtesy of taxpayers and the International Olympic Committee. Uh, and so they do have the most exquisite tests and the best machines. And you know, what is- They don't, they're not good. They don't work. The EPO is undetectable. Um, well, ultimately, scientists uh, are going to always outwit the, these tests. So even if we doubled or tripled the budgets of the World Anti-Doping Authority, I don't think it would make any difference. But this, this machine has gotten larger and larger over time. And what is ultimately quite unfortunate is that the athletes of the world, when they get accused of doping, first thing that happens is they get dumped by their sports federations, dumped by all their sponsors, and they have no financial capability to fight those charges. And so it creates a very unfair playing field. And Let's also talk about what is the definition of a performance enhancement. And so according to the World Anti-Doping Authority, hmm. their definition of a performance enhancement is, um, among other things, does it affect the spirit of the sport? It's purely a subjective test. And so you say you're not enhanced, but do you drink coffee? No, but tea. In tea? It's caffeine. Industrial quantities. <laughs> Industrial <laughs> quantities of caffeine, yes. right? And that is a performance enhancement. If you go and run your 10K in the park, having uh, 10 cups of tea, yeah. you'll probably run it a lot faster. Viagra apparently makes you run faster. <laughs> Viagra, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You hit it here first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree. I mean, on a, on a practical level though, how will your competition sit alongside the Olympics? Because presumably any athlete who now announces that they're going to take part, everyone's going to look at them and say, well, they must have been doping in the first place. So in a sense, anyone who takes part in your competition is going to have to completely cut ties 
with the normal world of athletics. Yes, we I mean, pay big prize money. Well, the objective is to pay prize money, absolutely. Um, and to create a fair compensation structure for athletes. So one of the things that I've learned going through this process, talking to hundreds of Olympians, is what abject financial poverty that they live in, even if they have a chest full of gold medals. And <clears throat> this is something that was quite enlightening to me because I thought if you win a gold medal, you're financially set up for life. And that is not the case. And so we want to create a fair compensation structure for our athletes. And um, the Olympics do not, right? $8 billion in revenue comes into the Olympics. Uh, Thomas Bach, the IOC president, flies around the world in private jets. He lives in a palace paid for by the IOC. Yet the athletes of the world aren't being paid anything. And it's really, really unfortunate that excellence is not being rewarded. And so ultimately, we're creating a fair compensation structure, including giving stock to athletes so that they become co-owners of this movement. But surely if you'll say Michael Phelps, you've won several gold medals, if you, he signs up tomorrow, everyone's going to look at his achievements and say, well, he must have been doping before that. I mean, do you accept that? Well, I was actually speaking to one of uh, the most decorated swimmers in the history of swimming. Um, uh, and he told me that he would love to compete because he's retired. Right? He, he's retired with a chest full of gold medals uh, and he's now ready to wants to jump back in the pool and says, oh, you know, taking performance enhancements. It'd be interesting just... if his times on performance enhancements were slower than his supposedly legal <laughs> times. Well, what I'm interested in is on your website, you have a hall of shame yes. section yeah. where you show world records that were set and then were canceled because the athlete was found to be taking drugs. Are you not slightly worried that the public has no interest in those records? There is no clamor for them to be reinstated. People, when they look at, um, I don't want to name any names of people who have been caught doping. I can't remember them off the we top of my head. We could do Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Lance Armstrong. He's, on, he's yeah. on your website. I think you've got Florence Griffiths joining. Uh, I don't, uh, reason uh, I'm Lance is on Because I'm not sure she was ever done. Was she ever caught doping? Uh, I'd have to research yeah. this. So you've, got, yeah. you've got them cancelled, the websites, and you say this is shameful, they should stand, they should be celebrated. Yeah. But the fact is that the viewing public of athletics don't celebrate them already. We have no interest in them. So why do you think we will have interest in them when you, in your, in your format? Oh, absolutely, because we're trying to create two separate classes of world records to recognize that there's a natural world and there's an enhanced world. And we should recognize that there are some world records that are objectively natural world records, and then there are some that are enhanced world records. And so the you know, Tour de France times that Lance Armstrong set are definitely enhanced world records and should be celebrated as the best of, of humanity and science. There's an honesty to it, which is undeniable. But, the, but I think you've already just used the word natural and enhanced. and. 99.999% of the human population is natural. I don't think that's true at all. Really? <laughs> Absolutely yeah. not. Absolutely not. You know, we are um, rife with pharma pharmacological enhancements. Not generally performance enhancing. Well, it depends what you define performance enhancing as. The caffeine? Caffeine, yes. Caffeine, yes. Caffeine has a limit. Name, else, name another freely one. Available. Name another one. Uh, Ozempic, which is the most popular uh, weight loss drug in the United States now, is arguably a performance enhancement. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, you know, we could go on and on about, um, you know, just walk into a GNC or a Holland and Barrett. According to, you know, peer reviewed scientific research, 20 percent of the goods in those stores would get you banned under the water code. Right? we're not talking about uh, just, you know, black market injectable steroids here. The 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 breadth of the definition of performance enhancements by the World Anti-Doping Authority is quite broad. Um, and there's something called a therapeutic use exemption. Mm -hmm. So a lot of athletes, uh, you know, claim to have asthma. A lot. Lots do. It's yeah. remarkable. <laughs> yeah, so it's, how many it's, have asthma? Yeah, it's remarkable how many athletes have asthma. Um, and that uh, allows them to take certain drugs that uh, wouldn't otherwise be uh, allowable. And so many people have actually argued to us that there should be three categories. There should be the full natural. Mm. And let's debate what full natural actually means therapeutic use exemption, and then enhanced. I mean, isn't that just the argument for the status quo, though? I know you say that like caffeine improves your times and so on, but we kind of, you can kind of sort of blur the lines about anything. And you can sort of say, well, we all kind of know what cheating is when we see it. We can kind of just sense it. And like the example of swimsuits, for example, suddenly all these athletes breaking previous world records when they're wearing these swimsuits. We all can kind of smell the difference and kind of know it. I mean, isn't that, isn't that the case? Do, do you think we should, basically you're saying that we should abandon the imperfect for something in, in quite... My, in my piece, I say that uh, if the testing was perfect, which it isn't, and the testing is, is I think we have perfect. to agree, is rubbish. It could, of course, be perfect. I think science can find out what's inside people's bodies uh, if it was properly found. However, I would draw the limit, instead of saying, I would go the opposite way to you, you're saying, all bets are off, take whatever you like. 
I'm saying you, if anything is found in your system that you couldn't get in, in a normal supermarket, a well-stocked supermarket, then you should be not allowed to compete. So, no, but that, that argument doesn't hold up because I can cross the street from you know, Sainsbury's and go into Holland and Beck. No, I'm saying in Sainsbury's. You, only, you can only take... <laughs> a supermarket sweep test. Yeah. What do you think of that? You can't take anything stronger than, than what you can find in a supermarket. Uh, but that's in, in an ideal world. In an ideal yours world. Is a, I think yours is a vision of hell. Mine's an ideal world. And neither, <laughs> neither work. Well, uh, the, the current system doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. Right? So the Olympics have gotten too large, too expensive. They've literally bankrupted countries. Um, and you know, the core problem is they move around every four years. They build a dozen stadiums and they throw them away after two weeks. It's so wasteful. Yeah, the whole thing's corrupt. It stinks. Yeah, it stinks. And I want to create a better system for the athletes um, and open up a whole new world of possibility. And David, um, we could probably talk about this all day, but we're going to leave it there now. Thank you very much. Isabel Hardman has written in the magazine this week about one of the latest diet fads, using glucose monitors to lose weight. It's been hailed as a success story from a number of doctors. But is it right for healthy human beings to try and control their glucose levels? Isabel joins me now. Isabel, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, you write in the magazine this week about the latest health craze, which is people measuring their glucose levels. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and why people are doing this? Yeah, I don't know whether you've seen uh, these people at, well, just in public with these yellow patches on their arms they're becoming more obvious now that it's summer and people are wearing strappy tops and so on uh they're yellow they're on the back of your arm and they say zoe on them um and these are um continuous glucose monitors that people wear as part of um the zoe program or other programs uh, have similar uh branded monitors um and they are not for diabetics. Uh, they are for people who are just interested in their blood glucose levels, in what foods make them spike particularly, um, and the effect that this have this has on how they feel as well. Um, uh, Zoe's not a cheap programme. It's over £200. Um, and it's part of... Uh, a program that also looks at your gut microbiome. Um, you have to send samples of your poo um, to their lab and uh, they analyse how you respond to all kinds of different foods and then help you come up with um, a tailored eating plan, basically, um, to become healthier. And on one level, who wouldn't want to know more about their body, about how it responds to certain foods? Who wouldn't want to feel better? Um, I mean, some of the advice that the Zoe programme gives are things like, you know, eat 35 different fruit and vegetables a week uh, because that's optimum for your gut microbiome. Some people might be horrified by that because they struggle to eat five in a day. Um, but it, it, that's not actually particularly um, something that you'd need to pay £200 to do. But I think that... The problem that I have with these blood glucose monitors and the problems that dietitians and nutritionists who I've spoken to have got with them is that they're not really relevant if you're not diabetic in that your blood glucose does naturally spike after eating and that's a sign that your body is producing insulin um, to deal with it. The problem that you have if you're diabetic is you have... Uh, constantly or dangerously elevated blood sugar levels and your body can't process those. Um, so it vilifies what is really a, a natural and healthy response in our bodies and suggests that we need to start worrying about that. It also, I think, most people go on a diet because they want to lose weight. I mean, they'll you know dress it up one way or the other and they'll say, you know, I want to be healthier, I want to be fitter, I want to be stronger. But generally, it's actually they want fat loss. And I think it really overcomplicates fat loss um, and suggests that you have to spend £200 and send packets of your poo somewhere um, to lose weight, which you don't. So, so just to be clear, so the people who run this study... Um of Zoe and, and other similar ones, they're making very clear that they think it will be good for you if you can sort of work out from your glucose levels what's right for your body. Is that And you're quite sceptical of that, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything sort of particularly evil about the Zoe programme. You know, lots of people say that it has made them feel healthier. I just think that the idea that your blood glucose spiking is a bad thing 
is really unhelpful. That's that's the main problem, is that it's part of this wider movement. And I talk in the piece about uh, the glucose goddess who's written this book about how to hack your body's response to um, blood sugar, in particular doing things like drinking, uh, drinking vinegar before your lunch, um, which, I mean... I just think no level of fat loss is is worth that, to be honest. Um, you know, you've got to live your life rather than being totally miserable and vinegary. But, um, but again, she's basically suggesting that we need to do things to engineer our bodies to not have this healthy response to eating food. Um, I mean, one of her suggestions was, I think, covering um, a piece of fruit in peanut butter um, because uh, it will change the way in which your body will process uh, fats and sugars. I mean, yes, but that's partly because you've covered fruit in a whole load of very fatty, oily peanut butter. So, I mean, sort of no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> Sounds terrible, to be honest. <laughs> Do you think it does sort of cur- encourage a bit of hypochondria as well? Or I know a lot of people, um, and you've talked about in the past, a lot of people uh, sort of get fixated with clean eating and that kind of thing. And do you think that's this is tying into that? I, I think possibly. I mean, I think there's always going to be uh, wealthy, healthy, worried people who are prepared to spend money um, over complicating their lives um, when actually, I mean, I, I do think that one of the reasons people are prepared to do this is nutritional literacy in this country is really, really bad. Um, we just don't know what we should be eating I don't think many people actually know how many calories are, are in things. They don't know how many calories they should be having every day or what the sort of energy expenditure that they have is. Um, they don't know what macronutrients are. So I think it sort of feeds on that confusion that people have, that they sort of want to be healthy, but they don't really know how. But uh, my personal view is you don't need to spend that much money to learn about a healthy diet. You definitely don't need to spend that much money um, to lose fat if that's what you want to do you just need to go into a, a calorie deficit basically and one that's not too steep um, there's quite a few really interesting uh, people in this space like um, a guy called the fitness chef um, who's on Instagram who debunks a lot of this kind of good food bad food um, stuff and points out that you know uh, often we don't know the calorie content of things so we say avocado toast is good food um, and jam on toast is bad food when actually the caloric content of the latter is much lower. Um, and, you know, avocado is a good, healthy fat and it's got more macronutrients in it and so on. But actually you're consuming way more calories if you have avo toast, which is, you know, such a Instagram eat clean, um, good food phenomenon. Mm. Um, we should mention as well, you, you say in your piece that, there's, that the Zoe isn't the only one. These glucose monitors aren't the only thing that's being pushed at the moment. And these sort of devices are growing. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about those as well? Yeah, there's also uh, a device called uh, Lumen, which allows you to hack your metabolism. Um, it allows you to understand whether you're in fat burn or carb burn through your breath. Um, and again, I don't, you know, it's, it's sort of... <laughs> It's difficult because I don't begrudge people who want to spend their money on that. And to a certain extent, the reason I know about these things is because I get followed around the internet by them because I am to a certain extent one of the sort of part of the target market for this. You know, I've, I've got an Apple Watch that on the face every time I check the time also tells me how many steps I've done. Um, and I am interested in <laughs> I'm interested in macronutrients because I'm a very sad person um, because I do quite a lot of exercise. I do a lot of running. I do a lot, lot, lot of lifting. And so I'm, you know, interested in my protein intake. So the, you know, the advertising algorithms think, ah, oh, but she'll also be interested in spending 200 pounds on this gadget. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people I know do end up going down that route. But I, I, I just think that you don't need all this expensive kit. And I think one of the things I say in the piece also is that actually most of us are very lucky to have boringly healthy bodies. You know, diabetics who I talk to are like, why are people wearing these glucose monitors? You know, for me, it's a symbol of... Uh, part of my life that is very difficult and stressful Um, and to a certain extent those glucose monitors have made it much less stressful because previous ways of monitoring your blood sugar were much more invasive and painful Um, but why do you need to make your body 
sort of abnormal or I guess special maybe maybe that's the sort of instinct is people sort of wanting their bodies to be special when actually you know there's that saying you're not a celiac you're not gluten intolerant you've just eaten too much bread and I think perhaps it would be better if we just accepted that but most of us our bodies are quite boring and they're not that special well I'll accept that um brilliant thank you very much Isabel that's it for this week once again thank you to Can Accord Genuity Wealth Management for sponsoring the week in 60 Minutes can Accord will provide you with the expertise you need to help build your wealth with confidence. Visit candowealth.com for more information. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week.